Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending September 8, 2018. And yes, the kitty cat's back in the show. People ask about her quite a bit. She, I don't know why, but anytime I turn on the camera, as soon as the green light comes on, she has to be like right here in front of the camera, but we'll deal with it. Anyway, thanks to Navy Thomas 8 for a lot of these links that I have today to share with you guys. First up is from ScienceNews.com. The massive Mars dust storm is waning. Now will opportunity wake? Uh, it's still going on, but it is winding down now. Um, this article from spacenews.org, uh, I'll just read a little bit of it. Opportunity has been hunkered down in Mars' Perseverance Valley since early June, caught in a storm that has grown to envelop the entire red planet. Since so little sunlight can reach the rover solar panels through the haze, Opportunity is riding out the storm in sleep mode. And I talked about it before, even in sleep mode, it does use quite a bit of power too, so they're kind of worried that um, it, it does just need a necessary amount of power to even stay alive. And if it runs out and the batteries don't, it just basically freezes up and they don't get a chance to revive it again. But they're still kind of hopeful about that. And uh, I've been, people have been asking me about the Curiosity rover too. And evidently where the Curiosity rover is quite a ways away on the planet, the dust storm was not as severe, although it's getting quite a bit of accumulation on its paneling. So, uh, but it's it's still able to operate and even take pictures. So it's not totally out of the equation. And I've got some links here too. A Gizmodo link about the Curiosity uh, rover taking a selfie. Um, I think about a month ago during the storm and everything. So um, it's still active. They're still hoping that uh, the panels can possibly be cleaned off too. Just like with Opportunity, once in a while you'll have a little. They have these things called dust devils. If you've seen them in the Midwest or in the Southwest. They're kind of like just little tiny tornadoes. Well, evidently, on Mars, they have those too. And if you can get one of those to come close enough to one of the rovers, they can actually give it a nice cleaning on the panel. So if you get a chance, check out all the links to everything I'm talking about will be down below. Uh, next up from sciencenews.org, a massive net is being deployed to pick up plastic in the Pacific. This is a really giant net. It's 600 meters long. That's, uh, what, I don't know, six to... Uh, 18, about 2,000, maybe 2,000 feet long or more, and it's kind of curved too, so it um, can kind of help with the, what do you call it, the currents flowing in, giving it a curved structure to kind of trap more of the stuff. Uh, I'll read a little bit from the article here. A highly anticipated project to scoop up plastic from the massive pool of ocean debris is poised to launch its first phase from Alameda, California on September 8th, which is actually today that I'm doing this report. You'll be seeing this report tomorrow on September 9th. The creators of the project called the Ocean Cleanup say their system can remove 90% of the plastic in the patch by 2040. Now they can't remove any of the little micro particles because the strainer just is not that small, but they can remove, I guess, down to a quarter of an inch, maybe even a little smaller than that. So uh, this was based on, a, I guess it was first proposed in a 2012 TED Talk. And uh, this guy named uh, Boyan Stat, uh, Slat, who was 18 years old, um, developed the system and it's a uh, designed to simulate a kind of free-floating coastline that can essentially herd the plastic trash into retrievable piles. The project, based in Delft and other ones, has drawn more than 30 million in donations from sponsors, philanthropists, and a crowdfunding campaign. Now, as usual, you have the naysayers, and they're saying it's either not going to do the job well enough or it's going to create more harm than it does good, but I say let's at least be willing to give it a test. Yes, there's a chance that it's going to snag some fishes and, and things like that, uh, I don't think you can do anything. I mean, you can't walk into the woods without stomping on um, and killing ants and beetles. So, you know, basically, if you if you move and exist, you're going to hurt something. But uh, if it can get rid of some of the plastic in the ocean, and they're also concerned that because of the fact that it will be cleaning it up this way from the ocean, that people will not be as inclined to uh, uh, downstream, why they say upstream, as, as inclined to upstream, get rid of more plastic. So they're wondering about that, too. Will people just not worry about... Um, their plastic use upstream and just let it keep going in the ocean because, well, somebody's going to clean up. I, I don't think that really makes that big a difference myself, but people do debate over that. And if you want to read the article, uh, check it out. And then finally, this is more about getting ready to go back to Mars, but it's the uh, part about getting a trip going to the moon so that we can set up experiments and uh, kind of semi little colonies and stuff like that. Uh, this one's called from TheVerge.com why Lockheed Martin is designing a tiny home to orbit the moon. But what it'll basically be is a tiny version of the space station. It's going to be relatively small. It's going to be about maybe a 880, just a little over 880 cubic feet, which is actually smaller than my bedroom here. Uh, my bedroom here is, I think, about 900 or 1,000. But the one thing about it is you do get a little more useful room because of the fact when uh, a 
rectangle like that is in outer space. There's no up and down, so people can actually use the ceiling portion too, just as well as the whatever you want to call the floor. I mean, floor and ceiling wall is kind of all interchangeable. So, what they're trying to do with virtual reality is set up and design this uh, along with the mock-up to where they have things in the right place, so they make less mistakes in the real world. And they even uh, have a video you can watch here too, where the um, reporter goes into a uh, virtual reality, uses the virtual reality mask, and actually gets to explore some of the space station. Now, uh, you think with it being that small, when you take a look at it and see the video, you're thinking, well, this is just kind of like a little open rectangle uh, with some sleeping bunks where you go to the bathroom. Where, where you actually go to the bathroom is the uh, Orion capsule that uh, takes the astronauts to the space station, to the mini space station. The Orion capsule itself has a built-in bathroom because obviously it's going to take several days to uh, get to this uh, space station. So, yeah, the Orion capsule is actually built with that in mind. So. If you want a little bit of privacy, which you will have, you go into the Orion capsule that's attached to the station, and then you uh, do your business there in private. So, yeah, if you want to get a chance, not just Lockheed Martin. Now they did this; uh, they interviewed Lockheed Martin, but not just Lockheed Martin is in the running for this. You've got uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, you've got Boeing, you've got three other aerospace companies all competing with different ideas for the small space station. And I don't really see any of them being much larger than this unless they come up with some innovative design or something like that because I mean you've got to carry this all the way up in outer space and all the way to the moon so you can't make it easily or cost effectively be as big as the International Space Station is right now I mean it would be nice if you could give astronauts that much space but I just don't think it's practical or cost affordable so uh, first part of this is a crucial piece of hardware needed for this gateway will of course be habitat spaces for a handful of astronauts to do research I think that's again up to four on this Exercise, sleep, and eat, but what exactly does it take to build a habitat for deep space? NASA has tasked six companies with figuring that out, although the Space Agency's Next Step program, um, through the, uh, the Space Agency's Next Step program, through a private, public-private partnership, companies like Boeing and Bigelow Airspace are creating and executing their own designs for models that could house the astronauts in the environment around the moon. So yeah, I guess it is best to probably test out these kind of habitats uh, when you got astronauts only two or three days away rather than uh, do the first test when you're on Mars, which could be, you know, months and months away, you know, half a year possibly. So probably a good idea. So anyway, that's it about it for this week. I will catch you guys in uh, two more weeks. Take care.